Good morning, everybody. You're all on mute, but I imagine you're. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I imagine I can imagine the greetings, but the real greetings are nice too. Uh, good morning. Uh, happy Friday and happy mapping day. Uh, uh, a week late, but um, uh, hopefully you're you're up for some uh, mapping today. It's one of my favorite uh, topics. It's also one of the most frustrating topics too, but it's pretty cool when you get it to work out. So here we are on our, our roadmap here. I've been working on uh, some things for next week for uh, text mining as well. There's some great packages that, that make it really slick and easy, just like on the mapping stuff. I'm gonna show you some packages today that uh, just make it about as easy as it can be to get started in mapping in no time. So we'll do a little text mining next week and uh, see where we get the week after that, maybe with uh, flex dashboards or, or tidy models. Our plan today, is we are going to take some health data, some COVID data, obviously, and uh, merge that uh, spreadsheet basically with a simple features uh, set of geometry and, and plot that. So we're basically going to uh, take our health data and merge it in with a map uh, and uh, plot that. Uh, that's going to be the bulk of the work we do. And then at the end, uh, I'm going to show you a package called Leaflet that makes it exceptionally easy to create an interactive map and embed it into your uh, you know, website, HTML, it's, it's super easy. Our, our markdown goal for today is gonna be uh, kind of a souped up HTML report that we, we've done that in a previous week, but the, the goal this week is uh, gonna have the one that's a little bit styled. So I'm gonna give you a template for basically making it look the way uh, uh, that I do, and you can modify that template going forward. Right? So it'll be, give you a slightly nicer version of the HTML report. This is our plot inspiration for today. It's a chloropleth map uh, from Shared Geo showing the number of uh, uh, cumulative cases. This is showing it on uh, May 4th. This is a uh, an animated plot, and I, and I have the code in the background to show you how to do that, but we're not going to focus on that piece today. What we're going to do is uh, figure out how we would take the data on COVID cases, and you're looking at county level data in the U.S. Figure out how to map our county level spreadsheet data uh, into uh, into this here. Let me turn off my my Outlook. We'll keep banging here. All right. So this is our this is our inspiration for today, and here's what we're going to come up with in the end. You know, toggle back. It's it's pretty close. They have a, uh, a slightly nicer uh, legend at the top that they probably, I would imagine, uh, did in some post-processing program like one of the Adobe suites, maybe, uh, if I had to guess. Uh, but we'll get pretty close just in straight uh, ggplot, uh, taking this data for May, uh, for May the 5th. And here's what our, our markdown goal was going to look like. So here is the we're going to make a Duke Global Health Institute R Markdown template with a, a simple little uh, table of contents over here to the side and uh, a drop down piece to show and hide your code. Uh, this will be our, uh, our output goal for today. So we're going to try it a little bit differently today that I'm going to work in, I'm going to keep my deck open and I'm using something called a Flipbooker and it's going to show you the code and the output at the same time. So I may not jump into our Studio Cloud, but I'd like you to go ahead and do that and look for week six. I'm going to try to stay in my deck as much as possible, uh, but I'd like you to follow along. So again, if you can have the video up on one screen and the our, our, um, the uh, our studio up on another or another part of your screen, that would be ideal. If you can't manage both, I would say watch mine now and you can practice yours. Uh, later. So go ahead and get in our studio. I'm just going to give you a second. I know it takes a minute to spin up uh, week six. So I'll go back over here and the first part uh, I want you to look at is your metadata at the top, your uh, YAML heading. Uh, we're going to focus on our, our markdown output first before we get into the mapping. And you'll notice here that uh, the output style is something called book down. Uh, and in the package book down, there's an output style uh, HTML document too. It's just a iteration on the original, uh, but it's uh, slightly nicer for things like cross-referencing, giving your tables and figures uh, um, captions that are uh, indexed. So you know if you 
add three figures. The third one is called figure three. Uh, this makes it really easy to do that. Uh, I have a link down at the bottom in the slide deck, which of course will be available to you, that takes you to the book down book and explains what all of these different parameters are. Every time I create a document like this, I usually open down this reference to remind myself, okay, if I, if I wanna show a table of contents, okay, right, it's TOC, I say that it's true. Um, do I want the table of contents to always kind of stay up in the corner? Yes, so that's the float. And how many levels of the headings do I want to appear in a table of contents? Well, I only want one for this one. Right, and to figure out what's the highlighting style, Tango, what would be the other styles? You would go to this link and um, do, it's trial and error after that to figure out um, which style you like the best. But if you go to this link, you can figure that out. So this is our YAML heading and it's going to output a HTML report uh, for us. Now after this, uh, so if you were in your R Markdown file and you scroll down just a little bit, I have a comment for you and then it looks like kind of a bunch of gibberish that we haven't seen before. Uh, this starting with the style opening is CSS. And this is uh, the, the part of our document that's gonna override some of the defaults for how our, our markdown output should look and feel. And you don't have to understand any of this right now. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but anytime I do anything with CSS, I'm always grabbing some template from somewhere and then modifying until it looks right. Uh, and you can do like I do in Google CSS to understand, well, you know, what is background size exactly? What is the background uh, where I can pass a URL of, of, of a logo that I want to appear? Um, how does that all work? But for you uh, today, it'll give you something to work with. As you move forward, this is a template that you can uh, play around with. But in here, I'm setting uh, what I want my titles uh, to look like in terms of color and size, the subtitle, the different headings, um, and all of my code blocks. Everything is controlled in here. So this is your CSS. So it goes all the way down to the end of 174. So you can jump down to here now for the content of today's lesson. I uh, just wanted to give you a sense of how we're going to create our output for today. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna load a few packages uh, that we're gonna use. Of course, like every week, we're gonna use the Tidyverse. Uh, a new package for this week is gonna be the SF package, the Simple Features package. It's a, a GIS library that is, is gonna make it super easy to work with uh, uh, geographic information. Uh, this uh, Veritas library is, uh, we've, you've seen it before, it uh, provides really slick color palettes. It's going to make it, we don't even think about what colors would be good. We can just call this package and it'll come up with something pretty reasonable for us. Uh, you've seen Lubridate, Lubridate before? When we work with dates and we need R to understand what, uh, what we mean by a character that looks like a date, how to interpret that, Lubridate helps us with that. And at the very end, again, I'm gonna show you the leaflet package. So if you go ahead and run those chunks, you'll get your uh, packages loaded. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, right here, run, run the chunk called packages and everything should be ready to go for you. Uh, we're gonna use two data sources for today, uh, county level data, uh, again, from the New York Times, we've, we've, we've gone to their repository before and county level population and geographic data from the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, so we can grab the first one first, the COVID data. Uh, we're gonna use read CSV as we've been doing and we're passing the URL where I uh, went to the New York Times GitHub repository. I found this CSV file that I want and uh, I grabbed the URL from it. So we're gonna read in that URL and it's gonna create a uh, data set called COVID. Now, You'll see Tibble here I'm calling on this. It's for formatting. And this is the reason why everything failed for me last week that I was trying to do this flip booker that, that doesn't really uh, matter to you, but it's gonna, you're gonna see the output of it. Uh, but it was just too big and Tibble is the solution to that. So don't worry too much about that piece. But this gets us the COVID data, the health data that we need for this week. Now, you can look a lot of places for boundary files, for shape files. 
sometimes websites will have an API that you can connect to. Uh, you're going to see that with the census today. Other times you might go to somebody's repository and download a zip file of shape files if they're used to working in QGIS or uh, Esri. Uh, people are very used to shape files. And so you could download those and uh, pull them into your system. But what we're going to do is just use an API uh, because we need some population data and there's no better source in the US than, of course, the US Census Bureau. And they have an API to get all of their data. The only catch is you have to sign up for it. So if you were to follow this link, you don't have to do it now. It'll take you to a page like this. It's super simple. You just have to put your email address in and agree to the terms of service and you're going to get a key back. It's going to be a string of uh, letters and uh, numbers and when you load the tidy census package you're gonna run this function census API key and you're gonna paste your key in between the uh, 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 quotation marks we're not gonna do that today I've got the data ready for you in a different way uh, to not to save us this step uh, but you can see here when uh, when we want to get county level data or state level data we can get it from the american community survey that's what this function is doing get acs and it wants to know for the counties the geography we're interested in is at the county level we need to tell it what variable name we're interested in and do we want to get the the boundaries do we want to get the shape files basically yes and down here for states of course we're interested in the state geography uh, the same population variable now to learn a little bit about what parameters would go in here, uh, you can go to the site Tidy Census page because it has a lot of great information about how to get started using Tidy Census. Uh, one really slick thing is there's a there's a way that you can uh, load the variables. Once you load the package, you can load the variables from a particular ACS. So you could say from the 2007 ACS 5, uh, and then you could view it. And up in your viewer in R would show you all of the variables that you could kind of filter on and search and get the variable code name. So this is like a code book for the American Community Survey without having to download any PDFs. Just in R, you can look for the variables that you, uh, that you need. So the variable that uh, we're going to use today is uh, 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 this one here, which gives us the population data we need. Because in the end, our example, uh, our, our goal for today is to uh, uh, normalize our case data. You can see this is per 100,000. So for each county, we need population numbers. And we're getting that from, uh, from the Census Bureau, from the, from the ACS specifically. OK, so if you're in uh, RStudio Cloud, then uh, you can go ahead and load, uh, run your loading uh, chunk. That's going to load both your COVID data and the census data that I've prepped for you and is in your is in your folder. All right, so that should load, and in your environment, then uh, you should uh, you shouldn't have all of this yet. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, get rid of a few things there and run it myself, just so we can be in the same spot and run this loading chunk, and you should have counties, states, and uh, uh, COVID. Uh, yeah, you don't have the Tibble line, someone asked in a comment, because it's just for printing in my slide deck today. Uh, it has nothing to do with what you're going to do. It, it was just the reason why my slide deck failed last week, and it has all to do with the printing. So uh, now what we need to do is prep our uh, both our geographic data and our COVID data a little bit. We'll start with our COVID data. Uh, you know, our original plot only shows uh, uh, 48 states and our data set has data both the geographic files and our, our COVID files have data on Alaska, Hawaii, uh, DC and Puerto Rico. Now uh, yeah we're kind of giving them short shrift by uh, kicking them out of our data set but you know in reproducing the original that's what they did so we're gonna do uh, the same so we need to uh, get rid of uh, these uh, these states and territories and we also need to standardize our FIPS code. So I'm going to show you um, how we're going to do this. This is the Flipbooker uh, format that I was telling you about where I'm going to walk you through what the code is doing. So if you notice up here in the, in the printout of the Tibble, if you can, if you can see the top of your, my screen, we have 141,000 uh, records. 
right, in our COVID data. So our health data has 141,000 records. And what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of uh, DC, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and Alaska. So we go down to 140,000 records when we do that, right? So we're filtering out all of their daily uh, case data that's in our original data set. So we've, we've filtered, which means we're going to get rid of some things uh, down to 140,000. The select function, which you are familiar with, uh, figures out which uh, columns we're going to keep. So I went from having six columns here down to selecting just date, FIPS, cases, and deaths. So I have four columns now. So we go from filter to select. Um, mutate, if you notice, before I do this mutate step, the date column is a character. Remember, a, a character to R is really just reading this as this is 2020-01-21. R does not interpret that as January 21st, 2020. Uh, but it can if we pass it the lubridate function that says, actually, you can parse this. Um, the format is going to be the year, the month, and the date, right? So uh, if you remember, when I do it like this with the two colons, it just means that this function, YMD, is from the lubridate package. I don't have to do this if I load the lubridate uh, package itself, but it's saying use the YMD function in Lubridate, uh, apply it to the date column, and assign it back to the date column. So basically, I'm just making a change in place, right? And when I do that, uh, you notice that it went from being a character, CHR, to a date. Now, it's made all the difference in the world that R knows that I really do mean January 21st, 2020. So we're going back to our uh, uh, dplyr verbs over and over again here, filter, select, mutate. We're going to do another mutate step. If you notice in our FIPS column, this is the, the code that identifies every single column, sorry, every single county in the US. And uh, you notice that some of them are five characters, some of them are four characters. The ones that are four characters, they're just missing their leading zero. It's like a zip code that starts with zero, but it's not there. So we need to add a leading zero because the geographic data that we're going to try to merge into has those leading zeros. And if you try to merge on 4013, right, to 04013, it won't be a match. So we need to make sure that we're going to have matches here. And the way we can do it is by adding a leading zero. So we're going to mutate again. And in the stringer package, there's a function called stringer pad, which this is going to pad our string. Our string is the, the column FIPS, and we want it to be five characters long. And we're going to pad it with a zero. So we're going to make any, any example that's not five characters, we're going to make it five characters by padding with a leading zero. Okay. So mutate FIPS. Uh, we're going to mutate in place. So we're mutating FIPS back into FIPS, and uh, we're making them all have a width of five. So you notice here that uh, we all have they all they all have that leading zero when they didn't before. So now we have our COVID prepped data set ready to go. We've we've done the basics we need to do to get ready for uh, plotting. Um, the how does it know to add a um, uh, a leading zero and not a trailing zero. Uh, you could take a look at this function, uh, strpad in R, and my guess is going to be that the um, that the default is to uh, add to a, a leading uh, a leading character. You could make it trailing, I believe, by putting uh, uh, right for the side. So it, it thinks that uh, it, it does it to the left uh, by default, but you could say to the right if you needed to have a trailing, uh, a, a trailing zero. So now we have to do the some of the same prep steps to our geographic data. If we don't, uh, if we don't remove Hawaii, Puerto Rico, DC, and Alaska, they're going to be plotted in our data set as well. And if you notice, uh, you're going to see here in a second that counties, we're, we're filtering in a slightly different way. In the counties, we're using this grepl function. I'm putting a, uh, an exclamation point in front of it. And to filter the states on the same things, I'm only using the column name. And I'm saying does not equal. Right? So for states, this is the easier one to understand. Uh, I'm going through, and there's a name column. 
and I'm saying filter out. I don't want it to equal, does not equal District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, or Alaska. That's pretty simple. But for counties, we're gonna use this uh, Greppel function, which looks to see, is the word Hawaii present in the name column? And the reason we have to do that is uh, because here's a short example. The, the, um, the states in the name column are combined with the uh, county name. So here we have Crenshaw County, Alabama. Uh, Shawnee County, Kansas. So I'm not able to filter in the uh, county data. I can't filter just whether the name equals Alabama or Kansas because the name in here is not equal to Alabama. Alabama is in this name, but um, Alabama alone won't be able to filter it. So I can do it for states because only the word Alabama would appear or only the word Kansas would appear in the name. But for counties, we're getting both the uh, county name and the state name. Now there's a bunch of ways to go through this, uh, ways you could do this. I could separate out on the comma because they all have commas. So I could create two columns for county name and state name if I wanted to. And then I could filter on the, the state name in this county data set. But I'm gonna take a different approach with this Greppel. And what it's doing is uh, in my simple example here, is I'm looking to see, is Hawaii present in these two examples, right? Is the text Hawaii present in either one of these? And so it's saying, uh, look for Hawaii, and where do you look? You look in the name column. And here's the result, false, false. So neither of these observations has uh, the characters Hawaii in it, right? So that's what it's doing um, when I'm, <clears throat> When I'm grappling here for Hawaii, Puerto Rico, District of Columbia, it's looking to say, uh, for all of the county data you have, look through each row and give me a true or false whether any of these things are in that row. If true, then we have the negative here, we're gonna filter it out. If false, we're gonna keep it. Right? So Greppel looks and it gives you a lot, we call it a logical. It's gonna give you a true or false of whether that thing is found in the larger string. Right, so that's what we get here. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> and the negation of that, right? So Greppel Hawaii, that gives us false, false. It's not there. Is Hawaii not in there? Well, that's true, true, right? So is Hawaii there? False, false, not there. Is Hawaii not there? Well, that's true. It's not there, true, true, right? So it gives us that logical that we can use for filtering. So when we do that, when we run uh, when, when we run that chunk, and you can go ahead and do that uh, in your data set as well, it's this uh, geo chunk here. When we run that, we're then limiting our geographic data uh, to exclude these states. And now what we can do is join our COVID data up. So we have our health data set separately from our geographic data, and we need to merge those uh, together. So again, I'm using Tibble just for some easier, easier printing here, and I'm gonna select a few columns uh, just to make sure you can see the merge a little bit more easily. In your code, you don't have uh, this step, just for the printing here. Uh, you can see I'm starting with uh, 3,100 uh, counties, right? So I'm working in my geographic data set, right? This is my county level data set, and it's just the geographic files. And in the US, after I've elim those, eliminated several states and territories, I now have 3,107 observations. And I'm limiting to the, the GOID, right? This is its FIPS code. So you have to notice here, we're gonna merge two data sets where the key, the thing that links them together, they have a different name. In the COVID data, it was called FIPS. And in the geographic data in our county's data set, it's called GOID. So we can take care of that, but just notice that's what's happening here. So here we have every county listed uh, once. And what we're gonna do is something called a left join. So what a left join says is, keep everything in the county's data set. Don't drop any of those counties. And then add to it anything you find uh, that's a match for the county in the geo prepped file we just did. So we went, we took our health data, we did some basic prepping on that, we called it COVID prepped. And now <clears throat> I wanna take from COVID prepped the columns FIPS and cases, and I wanna join it to counties and I wanna join it by uh, GOID and FIPS. Well, how do you know which one goes where? Well, on the left-hand side of the equation is what the key is called 
in your first data set. Like if you think about you're joining two things together, I'm not sure if it's gonna be right in the screen here, but on your left side, uh, you have the county data set and you're joining it on the right side with your health data set, your COVID prepped. So on the left side, the key is called GeoID. On the right side, it's called FIPS. Now, if both of them had the same name FIPS, you would have just had to say by FIPS. You wouldn't have needed the, the C parentheses, the equal sign. You could have just said by FIPS because they would have both had the same thing. But what we're doing here is <clears throat> we're, do, we're doing this left join. So it's going to keep all of the original counties. If I flip back and remind you that the original counties, there's 3107 of them. But our health data, remember, is in that long format. So every county has multiple days of data. Right? So all U.S. counties have more than one day's worth of data. They all have different, different amounts, but they all have more than one. And so when we merge these together, our data set is definitely going to expand because uh, uh, Baldwin County, Alabama is going to go from being represented once in our data set to all the days of the COVID data that we have. So if I flip forward again, that's what you see. Now we have 139,000 observations. And here, uh, uh, Otaga County, Alabama is now present uh, at least 25 times uh, uh, in, the, in the data set, right? So our data set is now expanded and we've joined by the key that is the GOID or the FIPS in the other variable. And now we have a very long data set that combines our uh, county names with uh, uh, our case data. And just so you can see that um, everybody has, uh, all the counties have different amounts of data in our data set. I'm grouping by the GOID and I'm counting. So GOID uh, 001001, uh, Otago County, Alabama, uh, you can see when I group by that and I count all of the times it appears in the data set, there's 51 days of case data uh, for that county. Uh, the county with the code uh, 01003 has 61 days, 41, 45. So <clears throat> uh, we know that we have a challenge. If we want to be able to create a time series starting from the very first day in our time series all the way up to the present, we have counties that have gaps in their record, right? Because they didn't start coming into the data set until they had their first case. So basically, we need to backfill in uh, for any counties that are uh, missing January 22nd, January 23rd, January 24th, even though they had no cases, for this to work in our time series, we have to fill in zeros for that. So here you can just see uh, the point here is that they, they all have different amounts of data. So we're going to fill in the missing days with zero. And uh, <clears throat> there's this really handy function called complete. Uh, and we're going to use complete and fill in zero for uh, uh, the cases for all missing dates. So you can see what it's going to do when I, when I take our data set that we just created, our joined data set, and I give it the function complete, it's completing on the basis of two things. It's saying for every GOID, for every county, and for every date, there should be uh, an observation. So it knows all the counties, of course, and for the date, it just figures out well, what's the very first date in the series? What's the very last date in the series? And then it looks to see for every county, does that county have an observation for every date from the 21st of January up to the present day in May? If not, it's going to fill the cases variable to have zeros, right? So it's taking a sparse data set where some counties don't have all their data and it's saying, well, give me a complete list and just fill in for zeros uh, where, uh, where there's no data for a particular county on a particular day, right? So <clears throat> you can see this going forward that we're gonna, we're gonna create a data set called completed that now has 357 observations, 357,000 observations, whereas previously we were starting with 139,000. <clears> and we know from our list here, they were filling in, if you think of all the counties in the US, they're at least missing, a lot of them are, are missing 10 or 20 observations. So when you go in and fill for all 3,000 some counties, all their missing observations, we really kick it up a good bit. And now we have a data set of 357,000 observations. Right? So now it's a full data set of date by county, 
uh, the case level data. So our data set is now called completed and, and in our studio, uh, you could do that. Uh, you did your join, you did your completed, right? And so now we're together at the rejoin step. Just briefly, I can show you now if I wanted to take our data set completed and just verify that they all have the same number of observations, uh, I can group them again by GOID and I can count them. And so then now every county in the U.S. in our file here has 115 observations in this uh, completed data set. Okay, so our, <clears throat> our, our work, our complete step worked here for us. Uh, so now all counties have the same number of records. So now let's take this completed uh, data set, right? It looks like this. And uh, we have the GOID, we have the date, and we have the cases. And we wanna merge this back. We can't, <clears throat> we can't yet map this because it's only three columns. There's no geogra geographic information in this one. It just tells us how we can link it to geographic information with the GOID. But I can't map any of this. There's no boundary data. There's no spatial information about where these should fall on a map. Right? I just have a key to link it to a map. So we need to join it back in with our map. And then we need to do a step to normalize our data by 100,000. <clears> so we're going to do a step where, again, we left join our data. We want to keep all of our completed data. Left join says keep everything on the left-hand side, which is completed, because that's what we're starting with, and uh, merge it in with now our county's data. Right? And in the county's data, we're going to keep uh, the GOID, we're gonna keep the county name. The estimate is the population estimate, how many people live in that county. And we're gonna keep the geometry, which is the, uh, all the mapping information we need. And now, <clears throat> both of our data sets actually, completed and counties, they both have the same key called GOID. So we can just say, we're going to left join our completed data set to a few columns in our county's data set by GOID. The next function is going to turn it into our uh, a nice mapping object that R knows about. So it's it's just uh, doing a simple conversion for us. Uh, and now we're going to call the product of that rejoined. So we start with our completed data set. We do our left join. So if you notice when I do the left join, um, I'm not, <clears throat> this has the, the completed has the maximum number of, of uh, rows that we're ever going to have, right? It's every county by every date. So when we join it to something, uh, we don't want it to shrink and we don't want it to expand, right? It shouldn't shrink because we don't want to drop any of these counties by date. And it shouldn't expand because there's nothing to make it grow bigger. Uh, so we should see once we do our left join, we still have 357,000 observations. The only thing different is we went from having three columns, GOID, Kate, date, and cases, uh, to having six columns. We brought in the name, we brought in the population estimate, right? And that doesn't vary by county, right? That's always the same for every county. It's, uh, its name and its population total uh, are the same. Um, and its geometry is the same too. Uh, you don't have to know anything about the geometry. It just comes for us for free in the census file. But now what we have, um, as soon as we run the next step, uh, we're taking it from a basic tibble, which is kind of like a spreadsheet, um, and turning it in this with this uh, st as sf function, um, we're turning it from a tibble, and look what happens. Now it's a simple feature collection with um, 357,000 features and five fields. It knows it's a polygon. It knows the extent of the polygon, and it knows the uh, coordinate reference system. Now, mapping is really easy these days, but it's also easy to make mistakes because you don't really know what you're doing in mapping. This is the category uh, uh, I'm in. Yes, complete is in tidyverse, uh, a question there in the, in the chat. Um, I, I know that the world is round, it is not flat, and because it uh, is not flat, but we wanna make flat pictures of it, we have to do projections to uh, make the make the uh, make our data or shapes curve a little bit to somehow better match the curvature of the Earth. Your coordinate reference systems and your projections help you with all of that type stuff. Um, so, <clears throat> anytime you're mapping, you do have to figure out which projection or which coordinate reference system you're using. 
it's, it's usually where I get my time sucked out because I'm trying to fumble around figuring out these details. Uh, but once you figure it out, it's not too bad. Uh, <clears throat> it's easy to go in one step just from that function, from a basic spreadsheet to now we have a mapping file that R knows exactly what to do with and where to place all of these counties uh, on a plot. So we're going to save all of this uh, as our rejoined uh, file. And now with our rejoined file, right, we have a file that's ready to go to map, but we want to change what we're going to map first, right? Because we have our cases, but if you remember, we wanted to show cases by 100,000. We want to normalize it by our population data. So we have to do that and construct a few other variables. So we're going <clears> to <throat> do that in this rejoin step. Um, I'm, again, I'm, I'm adding a few other things to make it easier for you to see on my screen so you don't have this tibble or select function. Uh, so watch the rest of what happens though. So we're starting with rejoined. We have 357,000 observations. Uh, and the first thing I'm doing is, again, not something you're going to need to do, but I'm arranging by my cases just so you can see the magic happen a little bit easier. So I'm, I'm arranging descending by cases. Not something you need to do, but just so you can see what change is going to happen. Now, the first step that you have, uh, like me now, is cases pop. So mutate means, again, we're, uh, we're changing some variable. And in this case, we don't have a, oops, we don't have a cases pop variable. So we are, uh, we are creating a new variable called cases pop. And it's going to be the cases divided by our population estimate times 100,000. And that's going to give us the cases pop variable. Right? So we're getting a normalized number of cases there. And then it's the next thing you're doing, if you remember the, the goal for today, they didn't plot a continuous gradient from zero to you know, 10,000, where the colors just change a little bit in between. The, 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 the goal plot for today is a, um, if I can if I have it in mind here real quick. The goal plot for today has a discrete scale. Right? There are bins. There's a bin for zero cases, a bin for one case, a bin for up to three cases, a bin for up to 10 cases, and so forth. Right? It's not a, it's not a gradient going from zero to 10,000. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to take our data and make it fit into these bins that they've given us here. So that's what the cut function is going to do. It's going to take our normalized population data and it's going to look at the breaks that we want. Right? And the breaks that we want are the breaks that the original one has at zero, at one, at three, at 10, at 30. And we're gonna pass those breaks and INF sort of the, the anything that comes after 10,000, right? We're gonna make breaks in the data uh, and include the lowest. So go all the way down to uh, anything slightly below, um, sorry, anything down to zero. And we're gonna create a variable called group, right? So we're gonna cut our normalized population data by these breaks. And now when we do that, we get a variable called group that um, a case that has, um, you know, uh, 1,080 uh, cases per 100,000 is going to fall in the 1,000 bucket because it's between 1,000 and 3,000. Uh, 989 falls in the 300 bucket because it's between 300 and 1,000. You get the idea here. So when we go to map, we're actually going to be mapping this uh, group variable that's cut, uh, has our case data uh, cut. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to another mutate. So we're going to create a new variable called month. And uh, this is just for the printing. I want to be able to uh, call it May 5th or May 4th. And I'm going to go back to the Lubridate package. And there's a function called month that's going to say, give me your date, which is here. Uh, and I want the label of the date. So create a variable called month where I get the, the, the month name. So 2020, uh, May 13th, I'm going to return the, the value of May. Right? So a, a variable called uh, month gives us May and all the uh, month names. Uh, another mutate step, we're going to call a, create a variable called day that's going to give us uh, the day of the date. So uh, 2020 gives me 13. And in the last step, I want to paste those together. If you're an Excel user, you want to concatenate those together. So I want to bring together a month 
and day, and I want to separate them by a space, and I'm going to create that variable called month day. So now I have a variable called month day that is um, May space 13, which just brings those two columns together. Right? And uh, I'm going to do a simple filtering step and uh, I only want to keep a, a certain uh, day of the week. So I can use the function uh, uh, w uh, day on the date to get the day label. So um, we're going backwards in time. So 4, 3, 2, 1, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, so I have a new variable called day label. And in the last step, I'm filtering to only uh, uh, days where it's equal to three. And uh, so three, I guess, I think, it's, I think it starts with Sunday, so Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, uh, keeping all my Tuesdays. So now we need to plot. So we're gonna take our data set, right? Our, we started with a rejoined data set that has all the geographic information it needs. It had all the health data that we needed, but what we had to do is uh, normalize our data and then cut it into bins and make a few uh, changes to our way we look at dates. So now we're ready to take that and plot it. So <clears throat> we can start with our ggplot and um, I'm filtering down to the uh, uh, month day of May 5th. Okay, so I only want to plot one day's map here. All right, in a later step you could animate this, but I'm only looking at May 5th data. So I'm making a ggplot with our constructed data set, filtering that constructed data set down to May 5th. And now I'm adding my first geome. Geome SF, which is, uh, we're using the simple features package. So there's a geome just for simple features objects, and that's what constructed is. Um, and we want to fill our counties in by group. Remember, group was the variable we created that uh, tells it which bin it's in, right? Is it in bin 300, bin 1,000, bin 100? So we're filling our map, our counties in by group, and the color, color always, fill is like what you paint with, color is the color of the line. If you can look here, you can see that in between the county lines, uh, they're white, and I'm making them size 0.1. I, when, when you're looking at a map, this big and such a small resolution, you need your lines to be really, really small. How do I know that? Uh, trial and error. I, it started with the size of one, it was way too big, the lines just basically took over the whole plot, so I just went down until I got to size 0.1. And now what we're doing is we're adding another uh, geome on top of that, so we're adding our state's geome. And remember, we took out Alaska, Hawaii, uh, DC, and Puerto Rico from states, so when we just plop on states, you now see that I have state outlines in addition to ha having uh, my uh, county outlines and fill. But importantly, remember how ggplot works by layering, so you put a next layer on. Uh, if I wanted to see what's below my states, I need to make sure I filled with nothing, right? I'm filling with NA, I'm filling with no color, so that I'm only getting white outlines for the states at a size of 0.3, so that my bottom layer of county level data kind of shows through uh, my state data. And the next thing I'm doing is saying, well, I, I don't really like these default colors that R is giving me, so I'm gonna go to that uh, Veritas package and uh, I'm going to change the fill, right? So scale, fill, Veritas, and D, there's a D and there's a C. Uh, the C is for continuous data, if you have a scale that runs from zero to 10,000 and you want a gradient of colors to go. Uh, D is for when you have discrete data like we do, we have these bins. Um, and I'm choosing option magma. Uh, you can use the default, there are a few other color schemes you can pick from. Magma, I think most closely matches the original plot we're trying to make for today. And with that, I'm done with my coloring. I don't, the, the Veritas package makes it so easy, I don't really have to think about what a nice color scheme would be because it does it, it does it for me here. Um, I'm gonna add some labels. So I'm gonna add a title, the number of COVID-19 uh, cumulative, uh, this uh, uh, backslash N, it just means print on a new line. Uh, so I'm, I'm printing number of COVID-19 cumulative confirmed cases per 100,000. My subtitle is uh, the date. 
Uh, down here I have a caption and I don't want anything to label my X or my Y axis. Right? So I've given it some uh, uh, labels that are nice. Um, I am, if you notice, there's a slight bend. So look at the map now, it's really flat. And here I'm giving it an Albers projection. Uh, there's an easier way to do this, but my machine wasn't accepting it. There's a code for Albers. So I had to put in the actual information that you can get online. Uh, but this chord SF is saying, how do you want to project your coordinates, right? And uh, most people, geographers would tell you, like, we're not going to plot a map like this because the U.S. really doesn't look like this. It looks more like this on, on, on the globe. And the last, one of the last steps here, I'm, uh, after I did my projection, I'm doing theme minimal. So notice how theme minimal kind of drops out my background. So now I have a nice uh, clean background here. And, uh, but I'm gonna make a few more changes to the theme to make it look like the original. Um, the panel background, I'm gonna make it black. Um, whoops. Sorry. The, the panel background I'm making uh, black. Um, I'm making my plot title bold and I'm changing the size to be a little bit bigger. Um, I'm uh, changing my subtitle size to be a little bit bigger. I'm telling it to, sorry, I'm scrolling here by accident. I'm telling it to put my legend on top. It used to be on the side. I'm telling it to have my legend be horizontal, not vertical. Uh, and then uh, I'm telling my legend to be on one row. So this is, this is probably as close as I can get to, uh, to the original here. Uh, and I think we did a pretty good job uh, today. Not perfect, but pre pretty good. So if you're following along in, in your file here, you should be down to plotting static here. Uh, this, is, this is the plot that should give you what I have. Now what I'm not gonna do today, because it just takes a long time to render on my machine, but we could do what we did in the previous weeks and animate this plot. So instead of just showing data for May 5th, you could go in and make a little video that shows how the county level chloroplast changes from uh, January 21st all the way up to the present, right? So that's what we did in the previous week, but we're not gonna do that today. We're gonna jump down to the uh, leaflet section to finish. So uh, Leaflet is a really slick uh, library for creating interactive maps, and uh, there's a package, uh, Leaflet in R, that uses this uh, uh, plotting library. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a real simple example to take the object we've been creating today, this SF object, this simple features object, and we're gonna put it into an interactive map. The previous one you saw is nice, but you can't interact with it in any way. So what I've done in your, uh, in your file here, uh, just to tell you a little bit of the background, is I've taken the data set that we created called Constructed, and uh, I've filtered it so that um, we're only looking at May 5th, and I filtered it so that uh, uh, North Carolina's GOIDs at the county level begin with 37, because 37 is North Carolina's uh, state ID. And the GOID, you know, has five digits to it. It starts with the two-digit state code, and then it goes to the county code. Um, so if I want to, if I want to filter our constructed, let me just open it real quick so you can see it. Oh, I don't have that up, up in memory. But if you look at your constructed, you'll see that your um, your GOID. Uh, has five characters and not two. So we just need to grab a subset of that string. So we're gonna say, we wanna filter the substring of GOID from the first character to the second character. Just give me the first two characters in the GOID and I want them to match 37, which means I'm gonna limit our constructed data set to just the observations, just the counties that fall in North Carolina. And uh, I am, uh, for the, for the uh, leaflet map we're doing, I learned last night when I was preparing it that uh, it doesn't like factors, which we've been using, so I had to turn it to uh, numeric. Uh, the next step is just creating some bins again for leaflet that you'll learn when you start making leaflet maps. Uh, but uh, I wanted to give you the background to say that we just subsetted, so we're only gonna look at North Carolina data. Okay, so here's our just our North Carolina data. It's the simple features object that we created earlier, limited to North Carolina. 
And now we can create a leaflet map uh, from this North Carolina. So when you call leaflet, it knows that you're going to create an interactive map. So it gets the, uh, the background ready. And when we set the view, uh, it's asking what coordinate do you want to start with in your view and how closely in do you want to be zoomed? So I looked up the coordinates for Durham, North Carolina, and I set the zoom to six. And then you start to see it when you add your provider tiles. Now, if you go onto the leaflet page, you'll notice that there's lots of different styles you can pick from. Uh, you don't have to know anything about how to create these nicely styled maps. You can just pick a style that suits your goals or suits your um, uh, taste. So as soon as I add these provider tiles, it's starting my view centered on Durham with a zoom of six, right? This is what I wanted to show. And now we're gonna add our polygons. That's just the function in leaflet that says, add your polygons and our fill color is going to be that group variable that we created, right? What, what bin you're in. Now, the, the, you'll see if you run it in R that you're gonna have um, a warning come at you. I didn't take the time to do this, but um, I'm, I've basically told uh, leaflet that we have bins that go all the way from zero to 10,000. But fortunately, North Carolina has, has not gotten anywhere near 10,000 cases per 100,000. So R is gonna complain a little bit that I'm, uh, I'm trying to use bins that are, don't exist in the data. They exist in the national data, but they don't exist in the uh, North Carolina data. So that's where that uh, error is gonna come from. I mean, this is really just a warning. So I can add my polygons, I can add my legend, and now I have a uh, map that I can fully interact with. And I can take it a few steps further if I want, and I can make it so that when I hover over these polygons, uh, I get a little tool tip that says, here's what the county is, here's the number of cases. You can, you can really go wild. You can put pictures in your tool tip. You can um, you could add points that correspond to testing locations. And so someone could hover over a, uh, they could zoom into Durham and hover over a point that shows the, um, uh, all the testing locations. So you can see this is a fully interactive map uh, that is really well laid out. You can, again, you can, you can pick the style of map you want. I've given you a few different ones. When you run this chunk, um, this add tiles, it's, I don't know, it's not, it's not my favorite. Uh, so what you can do is uh, you can run it the first time, then you can turn it off and turn this one on and run it again and see if you like the look of that map. And then you can turn that one off and turn this one on, run it again, uh, and then you can look on the Leaflet website and realize that there's lots of options you have to uh, pick from here. So that's it for today. Uh, we, uh, we figured out how to take a, a set of health data uh, and take a set of geographic files to merge them together, to limit both of them to show just the geographic areas that we want. We uh, used our same dplyr verbs for some data wrangling to uh, make sure we filled in the gaps because if you want to animate this you need data for every day so we filled in our gaps we constructed a few variables because we didn't normalize our our cases by our uh, population and we created a, a pretty nice static map i think uh, in our ggplot that we've been using and uh, you can see how much control you have over a, a, a ggplot and then uh, leaflet of course gives you uh, a, uh, an, an easy to render web version. And so if you knit your whole uh, page here today, you're gonna see our nice uh, R Markdown output, which is a uh, DGHI inspired template with a um, uh, table of contents here at the top. Uh, I've only added the first level of heading. I could have added more below this if you wanted. And so we have everything here. I could uh, post this online and I could have someone show or hide the code. You can also have a, a download code button up there if you want. Uh, and so walking through all of our steps here and you'll notice if you were to put all of this in just a, a normal uh, R Markdown template without the CSS that we added, um, you wouldn't get these colors, you wouldn't get this fonts, you wouldn't get this spacing. So that's all from the original CSS that Again, you don't need to know for today, but now you have a template that you could 
uh, tweak to your liking. Maybe the first thing you would do is say, well, I'm not with DGHI, so let me, uh, I'm gonna get my own logo file. I'm gonna save it to my Dropbox. Uh, I'm gonna share my Dropbox link, and I'm gonna put a new link here so that when I run it, um, instead of saying DGHI up here, it shows my Duke Psychology logo or whatever. Um, these are a great format for uh, research groups, I think. Uh, the, the, the files you have, if you look in files, you have this week six HTML file. That's the file you're rendering in your browser. This file is kind of big. It's almost six megs, which is telling you that that HTML file contains everything. It contains all of the images, all of the code to make it look the way you want. So you can share just this week six HTML file on Dropbox with someone. You can email just this file to somebody else and they will get exactly this. They don't need, they don't need R, they don't need anything. They just need to open their, this in their browser and it'll look exactly like this. Uh, so this is a nice way to send to your advisors and say, here's what I've been working on. You know, here's my pros, here's my code, here's my output uh, in, a, in a really easy to share easy to share format. So that's all I've got for you today. Uh, good luck mapping. It's both uh, a lot of fun and uh, extremely nerve wracking sometimes, but uh, the, the tools are getting easier and easier. I'll stay on the line if folks have uh, some questions. Uh, Jules, uh, R for our thesis data rather than Stata, can we just use the R Studio Cloud version? Yes, you can. Right now it's free and uh, your accounts will be there. Uh, eventually, I, I think they're always gonna have a free version. Uh, the, the limits would be on the free version that you know, if you were processing some really big files, there's a limit to the memory uh, that exists on your app that spins up. Uh, so what I would do is I would use our Studio Cloud. It's a nice way to free up your machine, uh, but then also you know have R and R Studio on your computer that you could uh, just run those same files in. Um, so R versus Stata. Um, R is uh, certainly worth, if you see your thesis as an opportunity to prepare yourself for a job market and to build your skills, uh, R along with Python are the two main uh, languages that are used in data science today. Stata is largely used by uh, economists, I would say. Um, it's an expensive license that if you don't have after you leave Duke, uh, there's lots of reasons I would think not to use uh, Stata. The R environment is uh, growing much more rapidly. People are making packages that uh, make it easy to do stuff like we were doing today. Uh, but if your goal is just to get your thesis done,